Hey everybody. So back at the neck journey, I thought I'd expand a little bit some of my journey on the adjustable truss rod. As I've mentioned, I feel that the first embodiment of the truss rod, that is the original compression rod that Thaddeus McHugh designed for Gibson in the late uh, teens, I guess he applied for the patent in 1919. I might be wrong about that. But anyway, it was granted in 1923. It was an elegant solution, and as I explained in my, my riff about truss rods, it seems to fulfill all the requirements with a very simple system, and I'm, you know, I'm always happy to, to have things work simply. <laughs> it's, it's better all around. Here's a, just a chunk of steel. That These are about the same length here, so I'm going to be able to compare some of these things. So... Here's a piece of steel. This isn't exact, but here's 62 grams. This is just regular cold rolled steel that you'd make a regular truss rod out of. Here's titanium, which I used for a while. Um, and you can see that it's a whole lot lighter. It's very strong, at least as strong as the cold rolled steel. But there are some prices that you pay for working with titanium. And I won't get into the whole thing, but for example, it does not braze, and it needs uh, special conditions to be welded. Without special training and special equipment, you can't stick it together with heat, which means that you need mechanical means to, for example, keep things from coming off. I mean, this one is one that I had welded, I guess. And then here's one where I just hit it with a punch a bunch of times to try and mechanically lock the thread into the uh, dead end of the truss rod. At any rate, titanium is a material that's worth considering. Uh, it machines oddly, it's tough to machine. It tears, it won't tolerate a light cut. It wants to be cut with a moderately heavy cut, which means that it'll thread pretty well you can expect to get a good result in uh, tapping it because a thread cut is a pretty heavy cut, all things considered. So anyhow, that's, that's the titanium story. Worth considering, worth using, especially if you can get somebody else to make you exactly the truss rod that you want to have. In my own work with steel string guitars for many years until very recently, I never built a guitar without an adjustable truss rod. And here's an example of one from the 70s that, that I built. And this has a double rod in it. So this has a rod that I got from Michael Gorian, which is two 3 16 steel rods set one above the other like this with a little block and an adjuster that takes an eighth inch Allen key. That's what I was using back then. It's a nice rod. It works okay. Uh, no, nothing wrong with it, but it is of course, by definition, twice as heavy as a simple compression rod. And then this neck that I looked at a little while ago was designed for seven nylon strings, and I determined that I didn't really need a truss rod in it because, as we've discussed, the, the forces that the nylon strings apply to the neck are, are very low, about half of what uh, the, we can expect from a regular set of steel strings. So um, in the mid-80s, I started playing around with some other schemes, a simple compression rod. I wanted to get away from the weight of the double rod. So if we were like just roughly the double rod would have been, when is that, 62? So something like 125 grams. Um, and then this is a 1 16th inch diameter cable which, you know, the engineering numbers tell us it's plenty strong enough to be a compression rod and a guitar. And look at this. I mean, what is that? About an eighth of the weight. So that's pretty striking weight reduction. And um, the way this was accomplished was this fitting is something I, I made, and then I had the end of it swaged on, in other words, crushed in a, a high-pressure die like, like this where two 
shaped dies would come together and, and crush the end around the cable. And then the material would flow into the uh, spiral surface of the cable. And it, that worked out really well. Now, I made a test fixture to test them, something like this. Anyway, um, just for fun, I'll show you this guitar has, um, this is from 1986, and this has a truss rod in it, just like this one, well, longer, we, we hope. And it was adjustable, it's, it is adjustable with an eighth inch Allen wrench that you insert in this little cavity here. And the nice thing about the cable truss rod is that you have some interesting options. For example, on some of the guitars that I was building in the 80s, prototyping guitars, I figured out if I had a, obviously this one doesn't have a control cavity because it's not thick enough to have a control cavity, but on guitars that were thicker where I had, I had carved a, a control cavity for access to the electronics, to house the electronics, I was able to, you know, cut a groove like this that would allow the truss rod to be adjusted and, and hidden within the cavity, and that actually worked just fine. So we know that the truss rod doesn't really adjust these stronger parts of the guitar very well and can really only be counted upon to adjust the relief in the first octave. That's how truss rods work. Then back to the swaging idea. So this is a set of swaging dies. You'd need about, I don't know, probably at least 20 tons, maybe more. I think our press was 50 tons and I never knew exactly how much pressure we needed, but we ran it full tilt. So this part that we're looking at here started out as a square piece of material like this. And this is a semi-tool steel. This is 4140. It's alloyed so that it can be tough and it's used for uh, high stress applications. I know that I think it's specified for a lot of car axles, uh, axles that deliver power to the wheels are made of 4140. Anyway, it's good, tough material. It swages as well, and you can see that we were able to take this quarter inch square dimension and swage it down to quarter inch round in these swaging dies. In order to get a grip on this wire, and this wire is two millimeters or 78 thousandths diameter, and this is music wire, so it's the same wires you play on guitar strings, exactly the same material. We had a set of dies ground like this that made these crenellations or the sinusoidal sort of shape uh, wiggle in the rod. And unfortunately, I don't have a piece of that to show you. But anyway, this is how it worked. We had two dies that looked like that, matching sine waves. And we were crushing, you can kind of see on this part, the end of it, you can see one of the marks right here that was made by this crenellating die. I love that word. We did the engineering on this, or we had somebody help us with that actually. And then we, we built a test fixture. I made this fixture where we could apply pressure, uh, that is tensile uh, force, to the rod and test the behavior of these things to check elongation and failure. And it was easy to satisfy those requirements with this rod. It was, it's plenty strong enough to be a truss rod. Um, and we were confident that we wouldn't have any failures, and we never did. We made thousands of guitars with truss rods like that, and that's the guitar. These are the style truss rods that were used in these fly guitars, and here's the, the place where you could access that with a Torx wrench and adjust the little fastener hidden in here. So. The adjustment is at this end. And I like that because it, 
it's kind of hidden. You have to kind of look for it. You don't need a cover to cover it up because people just don't notice it and it looks good even if you do notice it. So anyway, so that was the fly guitar truss rod. Worked out very well. And it weighs very little. Here's our steel part at 62 grams. All right, so this longer. But still, look at this, 16 grams. I mean, a 78 thousandths diameter rods weigh about one sixth installed, one sixth as much as a steel truss rod. And then here's a cable. So, you know, sort of ish, the same as the, um, not exactly, but it's in the neighborhood, maybe even lighter. It is probably lighter than, than this 78 thousandths wire. Again, this is 1.5 millimeters or 062. One by 19 stainless steel cable. And still a good choice if you're trying to keep weight down. One of the things that's a trick with these rods, uh, either the cable or a small diameter rod with swaged ends, unlike a regular old truss rod, which behaves itself very well without special attention, which is one of the beauties of it because it's simple, that on one end you've got something that's going to grab uh, some end grain material here and apply a force and at the other end you have a simple washer and a nut like a Gibson or a Fender guitar does and you don't have to worry about the rod rotating because it's too stiff to rotate whereas with with these things we have to make sure that this doesn't well, this doesn't travel and rotate when we adjust it and ditto, even more so with a cable, you have to do something to restrain it from rotating while it's being adjusted. And in this case, there's a little pin in the swaged part that's going in a slot in this plastic block. And sometimes, you know, I look at this old work and I don't know what I was thinking. This doesn't seem very robust. I'll tell you what, one thing you want in a truss rod is you want it to never break. <laughs> because that's pretty much the kiss of death. If you need a truss rod adjustment and your truss rod's broken, we don't really have anywhere to turn. Now I would err on the side of um, indestructibility, whatever other requirements you had for your truss rod. Anyway, that's a little truss rod weight reduction class. <laughs>